Praise the wonderful name of Jesus. Anybody else have a word and expression? I appreciate very much what I've heard. It has been edifying to my inner man. Hallelujah. And if no one has something right now, I'll make an opportunity each night this week, I think. Perhaps we could open our Bibles to an Old Testament story. Sister Peggy, what you said, I have thought about you folks in those very terms. Not just you, but a lot of the young couples, some of whom you know, and others in other parts of the country. I guess it's inevitable that there will be the testing time when our faithfulness is proved and we prove the faithfulness of our God. And uh, I would see it that God had you and your husband on the ground and prepared when a crisis came. I'm fascinated with how the Lord God Almighty begins to prepare vessels way ahead of time. And that vessel doesn't know he's going to be used, never knows. You can't know. Even if people prophesy to you, it's still dim <laughs> and tenuous. And uh, I had thought of you all over the years in those very terms, and I'm pleased to see the work of Jesus standing in your lives. How many are glad to see the work of the Lord standing? Mm -hmm. One way to interpret man as spirit, soul, and body, this is the con considered conclusion of some of the great thinkers in Germany. The, work, the spirit of man can rep be considered to be the work of God in your life. That's the dimension in which God works. That's his work, his business, his interest. And how many know God will see to his own interest? How many of you try to see well to your interests? <laughs> Some of us can be vehement, violent, impossible, stubborn, refractory, explosive when someone touches our own interests. That's the way I am. I'm very philosophical when you're not touching my interest. I can le lean back and smile. <laughs> and you won't know what my interest is. You may think you do, but when you touch the nerve, then you'll know. <laughs> and I'll know. We'll all know, and God will know. Praise the Lord. But uh, it is, there's something creative present here. You see, you're all young believers. You are, I believe, that with, with, without any, uh, I believe in an absolute sense that I must regard you as future leadership in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I now, one way to look at it, well, you say, Brother Wilbur, you're flattering yourself because this is your group of people and you want to feel big about something. So you're not just ordinary Christians, you're all apostles and prophets to come. No, no. I know that everywhere I go, there can be someone being spatially prepared by God, and it's better for me to think positively than negatively. Amen. Hallelujah. And so... I am a person who has been peculiarly blessed by the history of the Old Testament. Those famous Bible stories, the, the narratives of the Old Testament peculiarly bless me. In fact, as I opened the Bible today and read both in Deuteronomy and in 1 Samuel, I have my Bible open to 1 Samuel chapter 1 right now. Tonight, I do not plan to just take a text, though I saw two very promising ones yesterday in my reading. Neither do I plan to take just a short passage and preach in an expository manner. And Sister Peggy, I've been preaching 32 years and I'm still not polished. I'm 50 now, much of my ambition is gone, and it looks like I'm never going to be polished. So I will, in my own crude and dislocated way, try to share maybe Three, I saw three things today as I read this history. I began to read in Deuteronomy, and I say, in all honesty, the manifest power of God descended upon me as I read about Moses departing this world in the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Then I decided to go over and read in 1 Samuel, and I read the first part of this book, maybe half a dozen chapters or more. 
And I cannot read Old Testament history without being blessed by God's manifest presence. I mean, I felt God descend upon me as I read. That's happened to me time after time after time after time. That same thing I begin to read and the Holy Spirit makes his presence known. How many know that God can do mighty things by his word and his spirit working together? Is that not the way he made the world? In Genesis 1, it's the word and the spirit, twin agencies of creation working in concert to bring forth a universe. <clears throat> and I believe that just flashed upon my memory that back in around 1959 or 60, Joe Morris was at the Pittsburgh Revival Center. I think he's an old friend of Erskine Holtz. I think he's a man who preached in bib overalls and his bare feet. Quite a character, but a character for Jesus. And he preached a sermon that was, I guess, something of a masterpiece. I didn't hear it, but I heard about it. And when you hear echoes of sermons, that must mean they had an impact when they were preached. And he took that phrase, and I believe that Uncle Elder Wilson preaches on this matter too. In the beginning, God. And Brother Morris impressed upon the people, have God in your beginnings. Do you have God at the foundation of your life? Is God doing it? Is God putting it together? And that matter will come up again tonight in my speech by the grace of God. I'll, I will advert again to this idea. <clears throat> but to begin with, before I approach these three sets of contrasts, I believe what I would like to do is look into the third chapter of this book. I would like to read some and make some introductory remarks. The first thing we can say is that it tells us right in the story that this man, looking into 1 Samuel chapter number 3 and verse 1, which says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. That's a little bit the way it is today. Younger people are at Pine Grist begin to minister unto the Lord in the presence of some of us who've been around a little longer. That's an ancient and venerable order of God relating to the family. And uh, who did I hear say just today or yesterday, they quoted a man who, I guess it was my wife reading something, where there's a man going around and his chief subject matter in his speech and discourse is to try to destroy the family as a reality out of this world. He feels that what plagues him and raises a family, and we all know that families do do a lot of damage to us in some cases. Our parents impart their neuroses to us and that sort of thing. Family life can become a kind of a fatalism. It can become like a burden. It can become like a monkey on the back. It can be something that pursues you down the pathway of life quite a long time. And you may hear your mother's voice rebuking you when you're an old, old man yet. But God's order is still to be placed in a family. The psalmist says one place, he setteth the solitary in families. And I believe if one were an orphan or a very solitary individual or a very lonely person and you met Jesus and, and you loved him and you took him with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength, I believe you'd find Jesus putting you in a family setting. How many can say amen to that if you don't say amen unless you believe it? I believe God, I believe that's the kind of a God we serve. He's a father God. He's a family figure. The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And uh, Eli is called in this uh, book of the Bible, back in chapter number 1 and verse number 9, it refers to Eli the priest. He is the man, he is evidently the high priest at this time. His sons Hophni and Phinehas are called uh, the priests of the Lord. Evidently, Eli is the main man who is overseeing the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful order called the Tabernacle of Moses. 
For Moses built a church, it was actually a tent-like affair, and I've never been a spaceless on the tabernacle of Moses, and probably never will be, but I heard my friend Joan Ave speak uh, quite a few times, and a few others who specialize in the tabernacle. I've read the Bible, and I know that when he reared that edifice, which was made of wood and precious metals and leather and hides and various curiously wrought embroideries that when the whole thing was rid up the bible says the manifest glory of god appeared there how many know that you could see god at the tabernacle of moses at least at one time the cloudy pillar stood right at the door and god and moses spoke face to face <laughs> how many in this meeting want to draw near to god you want to get closer to the lord Do you know it can be accomplished on the basis of God's declared will and the operations of his Holy Spirit? It can happen. You can draw closer to the Lord. You can know the Lord better. That's, that's, in, the, that's in the very Bible passages that I'm going to read. That we're not given over to Adamic fatalism that... Well, I was a, an Anglo-Saxon seed and I was thrown into the yellow clay of Pennsylvania and there I was stuck and there I'll be. That's my destiny, my fate. Nothing in life much for me. I like the thing Peggy brought out that though Joseph was perhaps stuck here with his main root, he wasn't content to be there and he put forth branches that went over the wall. If you're sick of the dimension you've been existing in, start putting branches for. Don't wait for somebody to uproot you and pot you and ship you as a service. Don't wait for God Almighty to, to send a thunderbolt and translate you from here to there, but begin to put forth your branch. <laughs> You might start here, but you can experience the there in God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And the Bible further says about Eli, uh, I won't, well, it's in chapter 4 and verse number 18, that when he died, the Bible says, or he had judged Israel 40 years. How judged Israel? Judged Israel by the Holy Ghost. He was one of the judges. He was, I haven't uh, exhaustively studied the judges lately. I tend to look at things fragmentarily, but as I, I see it, evidently uh, Eli's the last of the judges and Samuel's the first of the prophets in a manner of speaking. Is that right, Brother Hoyer, more or less? That's more or less right. The period called the Critarchy is coming to an end. It's the period in Israel's history where God ruled his people by judges. And that doesn't mean they were like Roman uh, legal figures who were harsh and unyielding, but the very judgment that poured through their beings was God's own judgments. It was how God thinks and feels upon the throne. They became mediums for God to pour through. That's a challenge before us tonight, not just to be mere human beings, but to become open channels for God to pour himself through us. I want to tell you, I've seen a lot of miracles, and I know miracle workers, and I know prophets, and I've been present when God did mighty things, but I never cease to be impressed with the person that God can blow through. The person through whom God is free to blow in the wind of the Holy Ghost. I never cease to be impressed with that kind of a person, whether they're relatively ignorant or relatively educated, whether they're male or female, whether they're old or young. Anybody that allows God to use them in some way impresses me more than sheer intellectuals or anybody like that. I'm impressed by the channel person. And you know, as I sat here tonight and... Uh, Renee Adele led the song service. My mind flashed back to that crop of young people who were young back in the early 50s when President Taylor was in Bible school and Bob Mumford and, oh, a whole list I could name that I met that went to Eastern Bible Institute where God was meeting his people. And they used to sing a song of desire and a song of yearning in those days. And that song went, channels only, blessed master. 
but with all thy grace and power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. And when those Eastern Bible Institute students, corporately the 150 of them, sang that song, they were telling God, we have a desire to be channels for you to flow through. How many of you have been impressed with the whole idea of God flowing through a man or a woman, using them? That man or woman becomes super, superhuman. They transcend the normal plateaus of human experience and existence in God Almighty. I feel like telling a little story that happened to a friend of mine. He's, I judge he's older than myself by a few years, two, three, four, five. He's widely regarded as a prophet. He's a peculiar person and he's frankly a difficult person. But God uses him anyway. Is that all right? For God to use people that aren't quite perfect yet? People we don't quite approve of? He's been caught up to the throne room and been in the glory of God. But when he was not long out of Bible school, but he was older when he went like Brother Taylor. He was a businessman before he ever went. He was a logger, a lumber, uh, lumber man. He worked in the woods and God sent the best disciple Walter Butler ever had into the woods. And he taught him two years as they cut timber together. Either you may come to the Lord or God will go after you back in there. <laughs> and he took a church in western Pennsylvania. And a couple in the church... Had a small baby. Baby had the characteristics that it hadn't grown any since it was born. And did also have a cavity on the side of its head, like a grapefruit, inverted, a convex place. A concave place. <clears throat> and uh, they weren't very concerned. And when one day some concerned, maybe some older mother, sort of set a fire under them and said, you people better go get that baby checked. She was so vehement that they were motivated and went to Pittsburgh Children's Hospital and there they got one of those devastating diagnoses that science can hand out. They said, your baby is never going to grow and you'd better go look for a home to put it in right now. And they came home shattered. About 40 miles north to where they lived and where the church was. They got home, they got on the phone, they, they called the pastor and almost screamed at him. Get over here and pray for our baby. Isn't it funny how we get motivated? I'm impressed how that first miracle Jesus, Mary, his mother, says they have no wine, and he seems to get very negative. But, but the whole upshot, the whole result of the chemistry is it provokes his first miracle. <laughs> so my friend, though he's a very, he's built like a bear. He's massive and powerful, and he's gruff. But that pierced his heart and he ran over to the church building, got on his knees and got at the altar and he prayed to God and he prayed three things he prayed to God he told me. Got on his knees and says, Father, I want you to give me faith to believe everything that's in the word. Number two, I want you to give me the anointing that does the impossible. And number three, I want you to give me love and compassion for that little baby as though she were mine. I think it was a girl. He said, I didn't feel a thing. Get up from my knees, get in the car, went over to their house, parked the car. He said, when I went through the door, the wind of God struck me in my back. And suddenly changing from a man who had felt various emotions shooting through him, that masterfulness of Christ himself just permeated him and possessed him he said, in boldness, I walked over to the bassinet and I put my hand in the baby and I said, in the name of Jesus. He said, instantly, the baby that had never cried let out a cry. And when it did, Pastor Dave, my friend, and uh, the mother and father all started to shout. They shouted 20 minutes like Pentecostals, which they were. 20 minutes of Pentecostal shouting. <laughs> Then they quit shouting and walked over and looked in and they saw the baby's skull. The concavity began to vibrate and for 15 minutes his head violently, violently vibrated and in 15 minutes there was a perfect contour of the skull. They called the 
husband's mother, I think it was, who wasn't serving the Lord. She came over to the house, held the baby in her hands, and screamed. And that church experienced six continuous years of divine visitation after that miracle. But my friend, who frankly has a bad disposition, he suddenly became free for God to blow through him, to move through him, to minister through him. Hallelujah. You see, my friends, I'm talking about biblical possibilities. I'm talking about spiritual potential. I'm talking about actualities where God has met us in the past. And I'm passing on testimonies to you. Praise the Lord. Let's look at chapter 3. I guess what I didn't say out of... Perhaps I said, I'll mention it again, Eli had judged Israel 40 years. <clears throat> and the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Some versions say scarce. There was no open vision. In other words, there was no one single clear dominating word coming to Israel. It was a very scattered nation. Many people were doing that which was right in their own eyes, no doubt, like other periods of time where the distinct Bible statement to that effect Every man did that which was right in his own eyes because there was no single clear word coming to the people. The, the, the society was at this point disintegrated. It was not behaving like the body of Christ, like a unifying organism. There had been some kind of a deterioration bringing it to this point. And I feel like uh, just looking back into the uh, story to share a few things before I get to these three uh, main points I want to consider in my little discourse to you tonight. Uh, let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Tabernacle of Moses is at Shiloh. And the Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 1 of 1 Samuel that Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they were priests of the Lord at Shiloh. Now let's look at chapter number two. Chapter two and verse 12 of 1 Samuel says this to us. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. That's a Hebrew phrase that means they were utterly worthless or reprobate. And then it goes on to tell us in the story that when the Israelites would go there to worship the Lord and sacrifice, the young men had set up a regime of gangsterism, a criminal kind of thing where they were taking all of the offerings of the Lord by force that they wanted. They were intimidating people. They were bringing people under fear. And the Bible says... In verse 17, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord because men abhorred the offering of the Lord. In other words, the action, the ministry of, uh, of Hophni and Phinehas was to cause worship in Israel to decline. And the Bible said the young men's sin was very great before the Lord. How many know that the Lord sees everything that's happening in America and all of our various ecclesiastical groups and orders, and in the leadership, the Lord sees absolutely everything, doesn't he? Nothing is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to do, says the Bible writer. But he doesn't strike immediately, you see. He's seeing it, he is registering it, and he has a, uh, he has a judgment about this, he has a decision, he has a word and a will, but it doesn't come just immediately. I think the fact that the Bible God doesn't 
give powerful responses to everything immediately makes me admire him all the more. He's a patient God. He waits to see if men and women might repent. How many love him for that? That he's not hasty. Omnipotence and haste wouldn't go well together, would they? I've noticed the greatest strong men in the world, and I have been pleased that they usually tend to be meek men. They're not usually hot-tempered. Hot temper and great physical strength is a very bad combination. I've observed some of them at close, and they generally tended to be meek and had a sweetness about them and a certain humility and a certain reasonableness. But you know, uh, as I read, see, I'm going to sort of hit on a lot of different verses in this story. I'm going to range over this Bible story. Uh, where is it now? <clears throat> yes. Yes. The Bible does say in verse 22 in the following verses that Eli, when he was very old, lectured his sons, but he couldn't really change them. They didn't respond to his word. He says, boys, you're not doing right. He gave them some plain and clear fatherly moral exhortation. Do you know what's required of us when things are wrong? And things are wrong. And I'm not up here tonight to be a ranter. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up here to rant. I'm not up here to point the finger at sinful leadership, nationally famous. I'm up here, and we're working together tonight to, to receive some lessons in a humble way out of the Bible so that we might avoid the error of others. Uh, one thing I can't stand is somebody in the pulpit pointing the finger and, and, and declaiming against somebody, even when they're guilty sinners. For I've been aware of my own failures and sinfulness. But there is something interesting here. Well, after, he, after he exhorts his boys, and you know when things are wrong, when things come to an evil state, and, and all through human history, right since Adam sinned in the garden, that has been a, an everlasting repeated theme where... <clears throat> socially things are just wrong Th things are not the way they ought to be and it's so easy to become just a moralistic harper and when we get together with older people we'll talk about all the things that are wrong and I've tended to do quite a bit of that because I grew up with old timers and I have quite a bit of that in me to just declaim against all the things that are wrong I have to, I have to try to overcome that that with me can be a flaw you know you can have a good thing in you so strongly that it becomes a flaw how many know that? It can become a fault. For instance, you can be generous to a fault. One night in Dearborn, Michigan, a man across the street challenged my wife on the basis of the gospel to give our house to him. My wife did not give away our house. <laughs> because she perceived she had not only a gospel, uh, a gospel responsibility to him, but she had a responsibility to her children and to me, who lived in the house. But literally, a man, in all seriousness, challenged my wife to give our house to him one night. <laughs> Life can put you in some funny predicaments. But when things are re reach a certain state, there's something called for that we, as contemporary Americans, have a hard time with, and it's called, I'm going to use the phrase, moral effort. Sometimes you can find yourself in, in a state of being that it takes an enormous moral effort, even in view of the grace of God, to extricate yourself from it. Uh, Eli is not capable of putting forth this character and intensity of effort, he has descended into a state of what I will call personal fatalism. Much like a Hindu attitude, let come what may, I can't do anything about it. My moral muscle is weary and tired and I can't use it anymore. I'm tired. I tried with those boys. I told them and I told them and now Eli is beyond 97 years old. I think one of the things that scares me the most is when I see myself weakening and not being as willing or able as I used to be to put forth moral effort. I want to warn you young people here something tonight. I have the right to give a few serious warnings as well as preach people happy. Can you say amen? If you don't make certain decisions now while you're young, 
You think, well, I'll wait, Brother Wilbur, till I'm a little more mature. I'll wait till I'm better informed. You may find you have waited beyond a kind of dividing line where you no longer care to put forth that kind of moral effort. See, Eli didn't have his boys subdued when they were four years old. Now they're 55 and 60. They're three old men when they come together. Not a, like a dad and his boys, but it's like three old men with hard heads, nobody willing to yield. Hear me again. You're either going to make some decisions now in life and establish yourself now or never. And as far as we go in this meeting with Ray, it can't get any sooner than tonight. Can it? Can't get any sooner than now. So that's a, that's a moralistic theme, and as I promised, I'm not going to harp on it. I'm not going to pluck on that string in my harp a great deal and get your one nerve irritated. But I did register a thought, did I not? Can you say amen? Yes. I registered a thought. Now I see something fascinating here. I'm, I'm, I'm spending so much time on introduction, I must get to my main, more main points. But he finally says to his boys, <clears throat> probably in one of his last serious speeches to them, 1 Samuel 2, 25. He says, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? And then look at what the Bible says. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. I'll just make one statement about puzzling situations in life. You may minister to somebody and get no response and wonder why and think you should fast and pray more. One reason why some people don't respond to you, this is, this is only sometimes, I'm not making a rule or a principle or a blanket application, but sometimes the person you're talking to is already under judgment. And that's as much as I'll say. Those are serious elements in the text of the Word of God. Can you say amen? It's in the book, isn't it? Some churches, they don't allow you to preach on those verses. They tell you so, too. <laughs> now, I want to look at something else here. Verse 27. Well, the Bible talks about Samuel here in verse 26, but verse 27, it says, And there came a man of God unto Eli. T today, as I read, I was impressed as never before with that, that character that appears repeatedly in the Old Testament, that nameless man of God. Not a famous prophet like Isaiah who, can, who is a master of, of rhetoric and po poetic expression and who sees the vast uh, scope of the plan of God, but some anonymous individual who nevertheless knows the voice of the Lord and God can send him to the situation and all the Bible names it with is this anonymous phrase, there came a man of God. You know, I'm sensible there are a lot of those in, embedded in the church today. They're not famous. They don't have names. You never heard of them. You'll never hear of them. But from time to time, God will send one to give a clear message to somebody in a key position. Over and over, I read about this nameless prophet. He knows God just as well as Elijah and Isaiah, but he doesn't have any name. He has never done big things. God has not seen fit to give him a broad scope of activity. But when the need is there, God can say, I want to give you a message and I want to send you to Eli and I want you to speak to him for me, says the Lord. I became fascinated with this figure, the nameless man of God, who is not famous even in the Bible or in God's law because there, we don't know his name. Without a name, there can be no fame. Somebody called me from California about 16 or 17 or 18 years ago. Somebody I had met out there when I had that phenomenal experience in Arizona. 
And they said that a, a Jesus freak had appeared in Los Angeles with the power to heal the sick. He would come to big public parks. People found out he had the gift. He would pray for them for hours. Many were healed. He would never tell anybody what his name was. He would never take an offering, not so much as a dollar. And every time the meeting was over, he vanished somewhere and finally vanished for one last time. He can't get famous because nobody knows his name. He didn't take any money. He didn't take any glory. He just allowed God to heal the sick through him for a season. How much happier he is than the men who achieve fame and are now being cast down to the depths. I just read a masterful sermon called The Strapado by Alexander White by that thing in man that hoists him up to the heights with desire and then lets him fall and knocks all his bones out of joint. It was a Spanish torture device, the strapado. And our ambition will strapado us. Our desire for fame will strapado us. It will lift us up to a high place and then we will be released to crash. And the Spanish would do that in the Inquisition to you over and over until all the bones in your body were out of joint. There hasn't been a strapado in the world operating probably for several centuries. And yet lots of men are still getting strapadoed by their own ambition or their desire for fame. I'm preaching realities tonight. I'm preaching things that could strike me, but by the grace of God I want to avoid them. Francis Thompson said in the poem, The Hound of Heaven, in one unforgettable line, he said, when God began to court him, and when God began to draw him, and we got, the Holy Ghost began to show him Jesus and his saving power, Thompson, who was a genius, a sensitive genius, said, I feared, lest having Jesus, I might have nothing else besides. But my friends, it can be a very good thing. It is a very good thing to need Jesus plus nothing. Hallelujah. I'm preaching classic realities tonight. I almost feel like a voice out of the past. <laughs> I'm not preaching. How many know I'm not preaching a popular message tonight? You go around a big auditorium and get the American people in and tell them to praise the Lord. How many can praise the Lord for the man of God who had no name or that woman of God in society that serves the Lord faithfully and she has no name and no fame. And the man of God told Eli, I'm going to judge your house. And further he said in chapter 2 and verse 35, God said to Eli, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. How many notice the faithful God wants a faithful ministry? He's faithful to us. He wants us to be faithful to him. So praise the Lord. Let's look at chapter 3 again. Hallelujah. I want to praise the Lord tonight. That there's a people who's, who are sensitive and open to moral reality. Sin and righteousness and repentance. Praise the wonderful name of God. <clears throat> and so I'm in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. I had read verse number 1. And the Bible says in verse 2, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou calledest me. And Eli said, I called not, lie down again. And Samuel did, and the Lord called again. And again, Samuel did the same thing. He ran to Eli. Eli said, I didn't call. Lie down again. And in verse number 7, it tells us, Now Samuel 
did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. I just want to bring out, we can be a man or woman of the covenant. We can be serving God in the capacity. He was right at the tabernacle or the temple at Shiloh. He was, the Bible says, ministering unto the Lord. Yet the Bible said he did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And that's where we're at in this generation. God has apprehended a multitude of young Samuels, both male and female. They're ministering before the Lord and under the general oversight of an old experienced Eli, an older ministry, either good or bad, and yet they don't yet know the Lord like they're going to know him. And the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to those young people. Isn't that a critical moment we're at? Very delicately poised. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to try to share three insights with you. Here we have before us Eli in his wonderful ministry passing off the scene of history and we have God bringing the first great prophet upon the stage of history who will begin the orders of the prophets in Israel. His name is Samuel. And as I read today, and as I read about Moses and read about Eli and read about Samuel, I was impressed with a contrast in characters. I have just read to you the shameful state in which Eli is going to bow out. Eli is not going to finish up his ministry with many curtain calls in the spotlight, with the crowd uh, hilariously applauding him. But the light's going to go out and he is going to quietly move off the stage in shame and embarrassment. Because his ministry has not been everything it could be. It once was, apparently. His very name, Eli, means that one who has ascended into a high dimension. It means the lofty one in Hebrew. But though he might have soared like the eagle prophet at one time and had very clear vision, when the story opens on him, he has come down from his high stratosphere in God and he is more or less moving on a very earthly plane. I just want to point out how this man who had many wonderful qualities, he judged Israel 40 years, God trusted him with the gifts of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, uh, the, 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 the gift of faith, I believe when he spoke he, what he did to Hannah, and, Eli, and Samuel was born, no doubt that was a form of the gift of faith operating. He had apostolic and prophetic gifts, and no doubt gifts of a teacher. He had pastoral gifts. He was a kind of a universal man, much like the Apostle Paul when he was younger. But now in these days, he has come down from that lofty position. And uh, the word he gets from the Lord is a negative and rebuking one. In contrast, look what the Bible says about the mighty Moses. We're talking about a contrast in characters right now. I want to look at the last chapter of Deuteronomy, number 34. There are 12 verses in, ver in chapter 34. And in this chapter, in verse 1, Moses goes up into the mountaintops, the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah. And the Bible says the Lord showed him all the promised land. I almost see the Lord confiding in an intimate. Moses is his intimate companion. He's the one God tells his secrets to. And he's, God says, I'm going to give all this land to, this, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I cause you to see it with your eye, but you'll not go over. And the Bible says in verse 5, Moses died there. Verse 6 says he buried him in a valley. I understand that God Almighty buried him. 
in a grave that no man ever discovered. Isn't that an honor when the Lord does your funeral service, and does it secretly? Just you and the Lord. And the Bible says he was 120, his eye was not dim, and his moisture had not dried up. Verse 8, the children of Israel weep for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Quite a man, huh? Life is suspended for a whole month. No commerce, no farming, nothing. This man that went was so important and so tremendous and had so epitomized the will of God in the earth that a whole nation would stop everything for an entire month. There's no man in America can command that kind of interest or devotion or faithfulness, is there? No man. Uh, if every leader of ours died, business would go on as usual because we don't have a Moses. I want to tell you something. Moses had a walk with God and his footstep is still making the earth vibrate to our generation. That's how much might God put in Moses. Every time you tremble at the broken law and realize the holy God you've offended, you can thank Moses for the revelation. And he is the one who, 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 who develops the sense of need and hunger for Jesus. <laughs> they work together. Law work and then grace work. The broken law, then forgiveness from the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Bible says, verse 10, There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants, and to all his land, and, and all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. See, a contrast in characters. We must so live dedicated to the Lord that when we pass from this life, it will not be in shame. If you turn to the 26th chapter of 1 Samuel, which you don't need to do, you'll find Saul giving a summing up of his life, how he had performed. Saul says of his own self, I have played the fool. Too late to rectify it. You get the point. Two very different kinds of characters. I think one of the problems of the present religion in America is we have lived too much in the short term, too much just in the now, too much for short term gains and blessings. We have to begin to look down the road. Amen. Now I want to I want to talk about contrasting manifestations, both contrasting and ambiguous. Manifestations that look good on the surface, but they don't really contain the meaning that we would hope. Chapter 4, 1 Samuel. Samuel is now established as a prophet. Israel is in, in a real chaos and a real mess. They're under siege from enemies and their great judge is old and, and senile and there is a confusion reigning, but there is one hopeful note. There has developed in Israel one man, one young man who knows the word of the Lord. His name is Samuel. Look what it says about Samuel in chapter 3 and verse 19 and 20. It says, And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And did let none of his words fall to the ground. Verse 20. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. See, the whole nation knew that he knew God's voice. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. My friends, it is a tremendous thing to know the voice of God. I believe the strife over that is the reason for a lot of the warfare in the charismatic movement. It's the fact that there is one thing the devil doesn't want, and that's a man or woman in this earth who knows God's voice. 
We went through a big battle back in Pentecostal days, and there's a big battle again. It's the battle to know the voice of the Lord. And the battle can get so out, you can get so weary and say, well, it's such a high and lofty goal, I'll just set it aside for a while. There's all this strife and confusion over prophecy and this and that. And, but how many knows God can establish in the world a man or a woman who knows his voice? Hallelujah. As this is the hopeful note I see. There is a person in the situation who now knows God's voice infallibly. And I see a set of contrasts in this chapter where when Israel took the ark of God out into the battlefield to fight the Philistines, perhaps treating God too much like magic, and when the Israelites got out on the battlefield and when, they, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the camp, the Bible says in verse 5 of chapter 4, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. sounded like a great new revival. But they get beaten by the Philistines and the Bible says back in the city, When, they, when the man went back to the city and told it, it says, all the city cried out in verse 13. And Eli heard the noise of the crying in verse 14. May I say it was a shout that did not really denote victory because it wasn't according to the will of God. And the defeat gave rise to a crying that was not purely repentance. Shouting in the battlefield, crying in the city. It's another set of contrasts I noticed in the Bible story. And finally, I want to talk to you about a contrast of styles, and I want to refer it to prayer. I, I realize today with a new clarity that there are various styles of praying and a prayer, various approaches to prayer. And I just want to, by, to shed light on this by turning back to, I think it's chapter 9 of Joshua. Just for a moment. Praise the Lord tonight. How many praise God for his book and for his word and for the instruction we get from it? In chapter 9 of Joshua is the story of the Gibeonites who feared Israel and deceived them and got them to make a covenant by appearing to come from a long distance by having moldy bread and uh, very worn clothes and shoes. And the Gibeonites wanted to live and not die, so they devised a scheme and they deceived Israel. And they went right to Joshua and the leadership and ask him to make a covenant. And this is what the Bible says in Joshua 9, 14. And the man, that's the leaders of Israel, took of their victuals. And the leadership of Israel asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league or a covenant with them. And I notice in this story, something that impressed me today is that there were times when the Israelites, and through this period of history, would get an idea and they would do it. And there would be a disaster because they did not first inquire at the mouth of the Lord. They did not ask counsel from the Lord. Then when the crisis uh, avalanche is upon them and they're smashed, then a tremendously sincere prayer is, is provoked. <laughs> And I, I had clarified in my conscience, I thought about this for years, I had elders preach it to me, but today it just focused in my conscience. Two styles of prayer. One where we plunge into a thing, and that's the American way. The American way is very independent. You plunge into a thing, I'm going to have a ministry, and when I get it, I'm going to pray God's blessing down on it. You may or you may not. In many cases you can and do. It's conceiving God to be your auxiliary. You... You're the main uh, mind and you uh, 
create the architecture, the plan, the schema, the logic, and then you pray God on it. You try to get oil or fire or blessing down on it. But there's another style of prayer where the first thing you do is you go to God and you say, God, what do you want? What is your will? In that kind of a ministry, you don't have to pray God's blessing because you're in God's interest. There's so much here, I guess one would have to make a big long series, but I'm just skipping over high points, or touching high points. And uh, what I want to do now is look, look at Samuel. When everything falls to pieces, you have to begin to listen to somebody who has the word of the Lord. <laughs> and I don't mean slavishly, I don't mean that when you have the Lord, we're going to conquer you, you peons. You can't hear for yourselves, so you'll be the disciples and we'll be the disciples. I don't mean that. I mean that in, in some measure you're going to have to hear what the Lord says. And you may have to humble yourself to listening to a human vessel like a pastor or a teacher or your dad or your mom. Or it is somebody that's saved, some nameless Christian. <laughs> The Bible had already told us in chapter 4 that the word of Samuel came to all Israel. They know there is a man in their midst who can hear from God. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to bumble and fumble and to stagger around in the dark when there's nobody that can hear, but there's not much excuse when there's somebody that can hear from the Lord. You know what I think all this roar and confusion and battle and strife is in the, in the present horizon of Christianity, I believe it's the strife, the struggle to clarify what the Lord is really saying. Now, after that defeat and after they lost the ark and after the Philistines got it over in their land and they found they couldn't live with it, the Bible says in chapter 7 and verse 3 that Samuel spoke, spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, how many know there's not much use unless your whole heart's in it? Half-hearted religion can issue in awfully unsatisfactory states. He said, if you do, turn to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange, and I'm not preaching to you as though you're a people who need to have a big repentance and get a big revival going. We're just studying a Bible as in a low and humble way tonight. And maybe in your future, you're going to fall into a situation where there's a multitude of people all confused and there's much repentance needed. Here tonight, if there's repentance, it's going to be an individual thing because we're most all visitors here. And we're not a cohesive permanent local church. But if we all go out of here and repent, it would be a good thing, wouldn't it? I say, I'm a believer in ongoing repentance. I, I've been a believer for years, and I believe it now more than I ever did. It's been a key to uh, my ministry, I believe. And if you put away these false gods, that's Baals and Ashtaros, that's really the uh, fertility god and goddess of the day. If you put away the false gods, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 4 says the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpeh and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpeh and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day. I want to talk, I want our memory to, to, to be flashed back now to one called Jesus who came into the world. How many knew Jesus knew the Father's voice to perfection? He flawlessly knew the Father's voice. He never erred. In fact, he was just as there is a tremendous identity between Samuel and the Lord so that the Lord does not let any of Samuel's words fall on the ground. That's identity to an extensive degree, as far as it can be carried, probably between God and the human. But Jesus Christ was God's Son. He was out from eternity. He was and is the second person of the eternal Godhead. He is nothing other than the Word in absoluteness. And He came into the world, and He began to speak to Israel in a later date, just like Samuel does on this one. And Jesus Christ fasted, and He met Satan in the wilderness, and He defeated him, being thoroughly tested by him.
And his whole action had to do with destroying sin, didn't it? And that's what Samuel's doing. He's getting the sin of Israel out of the way so God Almighty can work by his power. said he judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. Do you know what Jesus Christ was? He was walking judgment. You couldn't come into the radius of, of his influence without being judged. The woman in the Bible readily confessed who she was and what she did in his presence. And then the Philistines hear something's up and and they, they are going to now come against the children of Israel. In verse 8, the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. How many know that Jesus Christ is the perfect intercessor praying for people? It's a wonderful thought to think that Jesus Christ intercedes for us. He ever liveth to make intercession for us at the right hand of God. The Bible says, and Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, a holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. Jesus Christ, calling upon the Father, offered himself as the lamb without spot and blemish. On this occasion, the past and the future are colliding. And when Jesus Christ was in the world, the old sinful past of man collided with the coming kingdom of God. And some thinker has said that strictly speaking, there is no present. There is a past and there is a future. And their collision forms a cross. The collision of past and future makes time in the present cruciform requiring a sacrifice. Hallelujah. I don't care what we've experienced and what we've known. God offers us in Jesus Christ a glorious future. But it may be entered into at the extremely stressful point of the cross itself. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. See, I'm preaching tonight, it may be better to go through something now and enter into the kingdom of God, into God's wonderful future full of promise than to just play it safe and try to avoid all of the battle and warfare. But I talked about contrasted characters, contrasting and ambiguous manifestations, and finally, two different styles of prayer. The one who prays when they're more or less compelled to it by disaster because they acted before they prayed, compared with that person who always goes to the Lord first. Lord, should I marry this person? And if the Lord says no, we know there's going to be a terrible commotion. But blessed is that person who can hear God's voice and grasp that voice, that word and do it. In the future, I don't know how long down the road, a year, five, ten, twenty-five, maybe just over in near eternity when you cross the line, you'll get so happy that you ever listen to the Lord. You'll have your own personal camp meeting. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I've done experiences already. I can praise God tonight for things he took out of my life. It hurt me at the time. But I can praise the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Those were a few little lessons from Old Testament narrative history, which I happen to love. And I would like for our ministers of song and music, if they would, to close this meeting tonight.